Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'll start with the usual things I say, which is um, I'm a native English speaker. Uh, so, if I speak too quickly, if something I say makes no sense, it's probably because what I say doesn't make any sense, but it might also be because I'm saying something in an idiom or something. So, if something's unclear to you, stop me. I'll repeat it. I'm more than happy to, to interact. If you have a comment, put your hand up. Please do interact. Uh, please do feedback. Um, this is my opinion. This is some of the kind of collected hard work of the computer uh, linked data community around this area. But it's not gospel. It's not canon. It's not any sort of authoritative statement. So it's all up for debate and all up for judgment. If you want to follow the slides uh, locally, you can. If you have internet, you can connect to that URL. The slides are on there. They're all in HTML. If you click that little checkbox at the top right, what that'll do is it'll show you the actual speaker's notes for the different parts of the talk. So that might help you as well if I am speaking unclearly or if you need to go backwards. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Foster Open Science uh, Project for very kindly sponsoring this talk. Uh, I'd also need to acknowledge both the uh, Sundari Project and the Center for uh, Global Intelligent Content, CNGL, who are the people who pay me. And I'm extremely grateful to them for that. And the research is supported by Science Foundation Ireland as well as the European Union. So, the semantic web. So bear with me for a moment. Okay. So I'm going to talk about really three things here. A big complaint about the semantic web, about linked data in general in uh, practice nowadays is that Lots of people are publishing linked data, but is anyone actually using it? There's a huge question that, there's no question that there are vast quantities of data out there. There are billions of triples of various sorts, and we'll discuss some of the main sources of those out there right now and what a triple is. But how do you actually make any use of it? What do you actually do with that uh, content? And what when you're actually treating your data and your offering and your contribution to the general human knowledge, how do you actually interlink it? Because what's actually valuable about the semantic web isn't the fact that we give these structured representations. We've been doing that for the last thousands, thousands of years. But what is different about this is that the linked data web and the semantic web allow you to interlink different perspectives on the same piece of content. So when I refer to the town of Göttingen, in my ontology, in my database, with my statements, I can also automatically dereference other ontological statements about them. So I can bring in geographical information from someone else's domain. And that's where this becomes powerful. It's a loosely coupled federated knowledge base. So suddenly we have the ability to say, I don't need to document everything about Göttingen. I can say what I think is important about it. And I can then say, if you're interested in the geological strata beneath the building, I'm not going to write that up for you, but this guy over here has. Automatically, the computer can find that and help you to integrate that knowledge. So that's what this is about. This is about this idea that we're trying to fit program, uh, programmable knowledge into the World Wide Web. When we conceived of the web originally, it came from a vision that's, been, uh, it, that's existed since the 19th century and possibly even earlier of this idea of organized knowledge, of exchange of data. And you can see what's happened, which is that over time, the web was the evolution of a huge degree of work that started really in the 1960s with someone called Ted Nelson, and even before that in the 1940s with someone named Vannevar Bush. And what they were talking about was interlinking human knowledge. The fact that one book, one document is not on its own a thing. It requires interpretation, it requires context, it requires reference. And how do we make those references accessible to people was the question. So there was the Memex system, was Vannevar Bush's system. Ted Nelson had various implementations of hypertext. And over the years, we've been trying to build hypertext systems. And the key thing about the World Wide Web was that it was simple. You could build a web page very easily. You could put that website online, and you could interlink other documents without having to get anyone's permission. And that's what the 
linked open data version of the, web, the semantic web is about. It's about the idea that I don't need to ask anyone else's permission to publish my triples or to interlink. I can just do it and we'll fix the problems later. And that's what this is about. It's about giving program access to the web. So why is this hard? Well, let's take this example sentence here. My center is giving way. My right is in retreat. Situation excellent. I attack. So this is Ferdinand Foch in the First World War. And I'm going to take some examples from the First World War in the medieval domain because these are from the digital humanities community and from the project of Sundari, which has been a major source of how we begin to understand the challenges that face digital humanists in this sort of work, as opposed to uh, other uh, problem domains that we've looked at, scientific domains, for example. Because one of the challenges here is that we have vast quantities of unstructured data that we're talking about. So one of the nice things about the biomedical domain, one of the nice things about the scientific domains uh, from a computer science perspective is they've already codified all their knowledge. Carolus Linnaeus put all of the uh, species of the world into trees. And it's very nice to be able to move those trees into semantic structures. Similarly, doctors have huge tables of all of the different types of injury, all the different types of diagnosis, all the different types of um, pharmaceutical. These are all structured already, and all we had to do was transpose them into a semantic structure. But this sentence requires enormous understanding to be able to make sense of it. And there are lots of different perspectives from which it might be interesting for different scholars. So, for a start, the words here, center, right, uh, center and right, are not the conventional senses of those words. He's not talking about the alignment of text on a page. He's not literally talking about his right-hand side. These two words here mean the parts of the army that he's uh, discussing. So, these represent his strategic position as a military, in a military battle. The other thing that you want to look at is the fact that overall the sentiment of this sentence is very complicated because what you have here is it appears that the middle of his army is, in, is being defeated. The right hand side of his army has already been defeated and yet he says the situation is excellent. There's irony there. So from a linguistic perspective how do we parse the notion of irony into a concept? And this is all of the challenges that we have here which is we have to overlay all these different conceptual annotations. And in the past, what we would have had was this challenge of, okay, well, we'll build this with XML, we'll begin to mark this up in XML. But we have to conceive of different markups for these sorts of things. And each markup, because of the way XML works, can conflict with the other, because you end up with a unified conceptual space. Whereas in RDF, we just pick the things we want and we let someone else deal with the things we don't worry about. I just wanna check I have everything I meant to say there. Yeah. So how do we provide the context for this piece of information? And for example, in a search or in a search related activity, we might want to, in other words, be saying to ourselves, okay, well, I'd like to find ironic reports from uh, senior generals. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to uh, consider, right? But very difficult to mark up in advance. So what are we doing here? The explanation for the notion of semantic web comes actually all, goes all the way back to <coughs> someone, something in the range of uh, Socrates and Aristotle. And what it's about is this idea of fundamentally the, the thing that we have in our heads a concept. So we conceive of a thing, in this case a cat named Yojo or Yo-Yo, I don't know. I have in my mind uh, a conceptualization of what a cat is. I know some notions about its behavior. It brings up all sorts of symbolic um, associations with me because of the way the human mind works. There are all sorts of complex things that arise around the notion of a cat. That concept in my mind is a representation of a real entity in the world, a referred entity in the world, an actual cat. But the connection is only in my mind. Another connection that we have is to a symbol, so that I can say to you, Yojo the cat, or I can say to you, a cat, or I can say to you the concept of Germany. The concept, that label, is neither my mental conception of the, of the city or the place or the thing, nor is it the actual thing. They're all pointers to each other. 
But in order for it to work, what, what the whole concept of language is and the whole concept of semantics is, there's enough coverage between my conceptual view of a cat, your conceptual view of a cat, the real thing, and the label. So we can use the label to say, roughly, we're talking about the same thing. Even though, actually, there are all sorts of differences about the, the precision as to what we're conceptually thinking about. And actually, if you want to read this in more detail in a much more organized way, I've linked the essay up there, Ontology, Metadata, and Semiotics by Soa. And he actually did some very interesting work on creating what he calls an upper ontology, which is that very high level notional ontology of concrete things, abstract things, to try and show the importance of these conceptual entities. So we're exchanging labels, and that's really what we're coming down to. We have the same word for something. Because we have the same word, because we both say cat, or we both say katze, or we both say sha, enough of the overlap in our conceptual reasoning and the real world uh, entity means that we can work on things. But actually, they're probably quite different in, our, in, our, um, in, in the detail of what we think of. And it's that, that thing of, if I hold up a piece of green paper, how do I know that what I perceive as green is what you look, what you see as green? I don't. Okay, and my view of green, I might think this is a, a mint green, you might think this is a forest green. But it doesn't matter if we're both sufficiently uh, agreed to say, give me the green paper, because we can both agree it's green as to whether or not it's minty or foresty. It doesn't matter in this case. And that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to let computers refer to the same concept, understand a conceptual level of manipulation of information. So, <clears throat> how have we attacked this in the past, or how do we attack this today in an important way? The first thing that we need to do is agree on the possibility of what labels exist. Okay? And that's what we call a vocabulary or a taxonomy. Oh, sorry, a vocabulary, not a taxonomy. And this is taken from the Library of Congress list of book bindings, which is part of their vocabulary for uh, descriptions of physical, um, physical holdings. So, we have some fantastic words in here. Well, some of my favorites are things like yap style bindings, uh, where are we, dough uh, do bindings, circuit edges, which I thought were going to be all technological looking, but actually turn out to be medieval, and uh, girdle books, guard books, limp bindings, and so on. The important thing about this list is not what's in the list. It's that, whoops. The important thing about this list is that we're both agreed that this list of words exists. So long as we all use all of these labels to refer to the same thing, then I can write one database, you can write another, and they will align because the labels will hit each other. Okay? That's the basics of what we're trying to do here at the lowest level. The next thing that we can do is we can start to organize these things. And in fact, implicitly in here, you can see that sort of happening because we have boards and some of these other ones are kind of types of boards and we have uh, case bindings and so on. So what we can do is we can have what we call a taxonomy. And in a taxonomy, like the best example of this is if you've seen species or animals where you have the phylum and the order and the so on. So you can say something is a vertebra and something is a, uh, is a mammal and so on. So what we can say is that a cat uh, is a kind of mammal and a mammal is a kind of an animal. And what that lets me do is it establishes this hypernymy or hyper concept. I can talk about broader, more complicated, or broader, more uh, generic concepts from the more, gener from the more specific. So I can group together all the animals that are hairy that, and that uh, feed their, their offspring with milk, roughly, and call them animals, or call them mammals, pardon me. And there's this is, what we call an is our relationship. Everywhere I talk about a more broad thing, I can talk about the specific. Or sorry, everywhere I talk about the specific, I can talk about the more broad. So all of the behaviors of a mammal exist in the cat. Okay? And so the SCOS, Simple Knowledge Organization System vocabulary, demonstrates how you can make these arrangements. So for example, we can say that vellum wrappers are a type of wrapper. Okay? Where is this powerful? Because now what I can do is I can say, 
when I'm querying about something, I don't have to say, show me all the vellum wrappers, all the, what were my list? Sorry. I can go, show me all of the uh, board types. I just want to know. I don't want to have to say the edges of binding boards, the beveled edge boards, the square edge boards, the hemp boards, the paste boards, and so on. And I don't have to have a search term that's 50 pages long. Instead, I can just say, show me the board. Is that my phone? That's amazing. Sorry. There is an incredible irony to my phone ringing during my own talk. <laughs> so I'm going to throw myself out and the rest of you can uh, keep going. It seems to have stopped. Okay, so that's my point. Uh, taxonomies, broader relationships like that. I can talk about Germany. And if a statement about Berlin is made, then that implicitly is a statement about something in Germany. So give me the population of Germany. I can sum up all of the towns if all of those individual towns have statements. So now we have this automatic inference coming on. This ability to talk in hypernym and hyponym. And from there we move on to the notion of an ontology. And the difference between a taxonomy, a vocabulary and an ontology is the difference between talking about cats and mammals and talking about Yojo the cat, cats and mammals. What the ontology introduces is the notion of instances or individuals, specific data. So, in a taxonomy, I can talk about cities being parts of towns, or cities being parts of countries, and I can talk about towns being smaller cities. With ontologies, I can say Berlin is a city, and I can make a specific statement about Berlin. And in this case, for example, I can say that the Book of Kells is a gospel book which is a narrower concept than an illuminated manuscript. And I can say that the Book of Kells specifically has the binding boards. Okay? So what I've now done is that I've interrelated the data with the schema. And that's the key point here. That because of this, now I can talk about schematic questions. I can establish behavior at a schematic level and have the data integrated into the middle of it and reason about the two. So, that's this notion. What we're doing here is that both, but both for humans, but more importantly for programs, we are establishing a common notion of understanding. That is to say, a common reference point on both the concepts, the labels, and the objects. So the interactions between things, the words we use to talk about them, and their behaviors all become uh, available to us. And hence we have this hierarchy. We have vocabularies which are just us agreeing on the possible set of labels. We have taxonomies which introduce the concepts underlying those labels, the theoretical things, and relate them to each other, the broader, the narrower, and so on. And finally we have the ontology which introduces the data into that, the instances or the individuals. And one of the key evolutions of this work from the 1980s on has been the shift from conceptual to uh, instance data. So a lot of what has happened is that link data is very big on instances and very flat at the ontology level. Whereas in the 80s with the, and the 90s and the early 2000s, you had the psych model, you had those sorts of things, which were attempts to structure all of this in the conceptual graph. That turned out to be very difficult. So, at the heart of the RDF notion, at the heart of this is what we call the triple. The subject, the predicate, and the object. Uh, sometimes you see other words like verb for the predicate, uh, or you see, uh, there's loads of different, um, but ironically there's very poor vocabulary uh, agreement amongst semantic researchers. <laughs> I'm embarrassed, but it's true. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that they come from, we've come together from different domains. So a part of this uh, community came from the databases community, and they tend to talk about schemas and data. And a part of this came from the AI community, the proper hardcore AI, we want to build you the Star Trek computer type AI people who are uh, really cool because they actually are legitimately ambitious. They're not like those of us who just want to get databases to work. But they talk about things like um, 
they will talk things about like predicates they will talk about because they're thinking in terms of logic. So they're often very much from the, the automatic logic disciplines. And you also have people who think about it in terms of facets. So they can talk about uh, properties being facets. And you see that a lot in the medical uh, domain in particular because I, I presume there's some terminological reasons there. I should have asked this at the start. Has anyone here actually, stick your hand up if you've published RDF. Not RDF. RDF has been published in your presence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, that's part, of the, that's part of the power of the web, isn't it? We can be in different rooms and on our iPhones saying, this is terrible RDF. Um, so, are most people here familiar with the notion of a database table? Okay, so this is a good place to start. So we have a database table here. Okay, I have three rows. Uh, 1979 Krakow, 2012 Munich, and 2014 Buenos Aires. Okay. I have two columns, year and city, and I'm going to translate these into triples for you because this gives you the idea of how the triples work. So, in the first case, we have what we call the subject. So, the subject you can think of as the row in the table. It's the instance, the individual. Okay? So, Yojo, the cat, or this line here, for example, or this line here. Yeah, sorry. Then we have the predicate, and that's the, the property, the attribute, the column of the table. So this is what it, where it comes back to Aristotle, who had the idea that he separated out the properties of things from the things and their classes. Uh, and there's a famous instance of this, which was um, Diogenes of Sinope and Plato, because Plato came up with this definition that a... a uh, a man was a two-legged, featherless uh, animal. And Diogenes the Cynic, being a helpful man that he was, plucked a chicken and threw it into the room and said, Behold Plato's man. <laughs> so then Plato had to, uh, it's said anyway, revise his definition to include rounded nails or something. And that's a lesson to us all on the dangers of making minimal statements about ontologies. But the point is that we have these properties that exist separately from the instances and separately from the classes. So I have a name, I have a height, I have a gender, I have all of these other things. They exist as descriptors of my, in, but they, I am also an instance. And then I have various classes grouped on the basis of my properties. So for example, the fact that I have a PhD puts me in one group. So that's our predicates. And then we have our object. And the object is the value of a predicate in its particular subject. Okay, so it is the cell in the table. Okay, so this triple here, for example, is row one has city cracker. Does that make sense to people? So that's what a triple is. That's what you need to think about. If you go, if you go away today knowing just that, you've gone a very long way to understanding the challenges of modeling things in RDF. What is the challenge about this? I can only make one statement at a time. Okay? So, I can make a statement like this, per, uh, this uh, entity has the city Krakow. A second triple is this one, year 1979. Okay? But the subject, so the question is what is the subject in this case? So, can anyone tell me actually what this table is? I'll give you a hint, I wrote this table in Rome. Oh. It's not birthplaces, it's the last archbishoprics of the last three popes and the date at which they became pope. <laughs> so Buenos Aires, Munich, actually I think the dates are wrong for one of them. So, <clears throat> to take our previous example, our Book of Kells example, here are the triples that I've decomposed from that. Okay, so we have that boards is a binding. So that means that the board is an instance of the binding class. The book of Kells is an instance of the gospel book. The gospel book is, in, is a subclass of the manuscript. Book of Kells has the binding bindings and so on. And we distinguish two important things here. First of all, 
we have instances and we have classes but we also have what we call literal values and the reason for this is that I don't want to have to build a class for every number I don't want to have to build a class for every possible string of text there are at least five of them and that's more than I want to work on there are lots of these things that are in the open value space okay but the challenge that I have here is I'm restricted to triples so if I say book of Kells has title and that I can't make any more statements about this value and we'll explore that in a second but it makes this this issue of this not being able to be a subject of a triple is a challenge then because it means ultimately everything ends up becoming an instance if you are too broad in your ontological design so we have this notion of a schema a schema has a class which groups together entities with common properties. An individual is a, or is a member of a class. And individuals have properties with values. And we make all of these statements using these subject, predicate, object, triples. Okay? These three is a magic number. It's the same as this dbpedia value three. And it has the title, the magic number. Okay? What's important about this is that the instinct, particularly amongst um, computer scientists and other people who, uh, actually archivists and librarians seem to have the same uh, addiction, which is to be what we call extensional, which is to say, we will build a schema and then we will fit the data to the schema. Okay? Experience has shown that this is an extremely dangerous way of approaching the challenge of data. Why? Everything has an exception. So the class of mammals, if you look in reality, lots of mammals aren't really mammals or they have some properties but not others and so on. So much better than thinking about this idea that you build a schema and then fit the data is to do the other thing around. You collect the instances, you identify their properties, and then you group them together into classes. So you go the other way around and that's called an intentional model. And in doing it that way, you have the advantage that you're actually drawing from the data to make things happen. And that is what, that's why linked open data has worked better for small values is better than previous attempts at the semantic web. And it's also why when you look, there are billions of triples being published now. They are all statements about the properties of instances rather than complex statements about schemas. And that's why that's happening. So RDF is extremely simple. It's just a framework. It doesn't actually distinguish very well between instances and classes and between properties and so on. So we apply a slightly higher level conceptual um, language to it. Now we could use SCOS if we were just building a taxonomy, but we want to have an ontology with data, instances, and properties. And we want to distinguish individuals from uh, classes, and we want to distinguish object properties, which is to say where the object of the triple is a class, is an instance of a class against the literal type. And so what we have is what we call the OWL language. And OWL, most naturally of all, stands for web ontology language. I've never understood why you get OWL from what is clearly W-O-L, but where this came from was that there used to be two languages, DAML and OIL. DAML was the European one, I think, and OIL was the American one, but they came together uh, in the same way that two cars come together on a motorway and the result was the web ontology language. Um, classes have rich semantics. We can do some reasoning in OWL. So we can do this automatic translation between subclass and superclass and group things together so that we can create new knowledge. That's the key point about this from using OWL and using inference. I can make a statement like Darth Vader is the father of Luke Skywalker, spoiler warning. And I don't also have to make the statement, Luke Skywalker is the son of Darth Vader, because I can have a relationship that inverts. So I can say that son of is the opposite of father in direction. And if someone is the father of, they are also, then the, the other statement is also true automatically. That becomes something that is valuable to be able to do, because it means that I can make 
all the individual statements along the way, I can be inconsistent. I can just mark up statements about sons or statements about fathers and reconcile the whole thing in query. Now, there are extremely limited cases in, in which this works well, and you need to hire someone with a gigantic brain to figure out how your ontology works because it's all this, what they call frame logic, which is a bit like first order logic. But it works very well if, if you're careful. It also means that what you can do is this very important rule arises. Don't reinvent the wheel. Don't create a new class. Don't create a new property. Don't create a new instance uh, if something already exists. Don't make the wheel happen again. Okay? And that happens at a technology level as well. We have this thing called a semantic web layer cake. Um, um, at the bottom of it are URIs or IORIs. So we take the way the web addresses things and we use that. We use Unicode to write everything so that everyone in the world can use their native language. Or and so that we can have that little um, smiley face or plain symbol from emoji in our labels if we want them. Syntax, we often use XML as our binding level. Even if we're not using XML, the semantics of XML are used. We interchange the data with RDF. We create taxonomies with RDFS. We query using Sparkle, which is a language I'll talk about now. We have OWL. We can write the rules in RIF. And these ones don't exist yet. Right? But in the course of my career so far, the layer cake has gradually been, been being populated in a, in a nice way. When I started out, this was pretty much agreed. This was pretty much agreed. This was coming. This was not agreed at all. This was not agreed at all. And this area down here was very murky. The bottom of the cake was soggy. Now it's very agreed that, very much agreed that these should be, in fact, internationalized resource identifiers. That we're going to use Unicode, because let's face it, it has to be fair to let classes have Korean names. It's not, idea, not valid to just assume it's going to be in Latin script. The syntax of XML, the data interchange, and so on are fine. And then some of these become very interesting because this one along the side of cryptography is an intriguing one because once I'm starting to use this for medical data, that's now becoming a real issue because my phone is starting to gather a lot of data about me that implicitly could be health data that I would want to encrypt or financial information. You know, uh, Apple have just released a way of paying with your phone. That actually legitimately needs cryptographic stuff associated with it. And may, I may want to publish parts of it in a triple. Proof and unifying logic and trust also become interesting because how do I do things like if I begin to interlink and leverage on this stuff, how do I make sure it makes sense? So how do I snap my fingers and make the, the web work? How do I actually do something with this? What's the practice here? So we have this notion of semantics. A lot of, pro, a lot of presentations kind of stop here, I find. And you're sort of, everyone's left in the room going, I still don't know what, I, what it's about. And I'm, I felt like that a lot of the time myself. So what I was trying to do now is talk about actually some of the practice here. So this is the linked data web as it stands. Um, this FU Berlin are the people who are, oh sorry, Uni Mannheim have done the new version of this. This was originally done by Michael Signiak and a few people in Derry in Galway in Ireland. But what they did was they crawled the web of linked data and they looked at all of the interlinks so these are all statements between different databases. Okay. Now, and what they did, which is really nice about this, is they then colored it by thematic area. So some of these are medical databases. Some of these are publication databases. There's music. There's all of human interaction in some fashion. What's interesting is that right at the heart of this is this here, which is a project called DBpedia. And DBpedia what it did was it took automatically the info boxes, which are the side structured boxes from um, Wikipedia pages, and it turned them into RDF triples. And that was an incredibly clever thing to do because it did two things. First of all, it began to, to, to get over this question of how do I actually write a bunch of RDF and why would I bother? The answer is you don't. You transform what you have and you make RDF out of it. The second thing is that Wikipedia is 
arguably a pretty good first approximation of all human knowledge. So anything that people know about typically has a Wikipedia page. So it's a good way of getting that universal reference out of the way. And that's what DBpedia is. Everything interlinks to that. It becomes a universal grammar, a universal glossary of terms. So actually, if you follow that link up there, there this is a clickable SVG. So you can actually click any of the individual data sets here and see what's in there. So things like DBLP are in here, things like um, Biomed, PubMed Central is in here, all that sort of stuff is in there. There's all sorts of cool databases to have a look at. So see what's there. You can explore, you can look for what your, the VIAF database is in there. The OCLC stuff is in there as well. So when I'm consuming linked data, what am I doing? There are three things I need to consume these days, okay? It's not enough anymore for me to uh, simply uh, publish my own data. What we're thinking here is that we want to get our hands not just on data, not just on statements of fact, but also on the reuse of the concepts and the terminology. So I'm now going to refer to the DBpedia page on Berlin when I talk about Berlin. I'm going to refer to the concept of a city taken from geo names. I'm going to relax about my semantics, approximate it, take someone else's representation, even if it's not exactly what I wanted, because talking, the conversation is more important. The interlinking is more important than this absolute rigid correctness of the data. So this, this, is, this is the other reason to go on a database, on a data first approach rather than a schema first approach. Otherwise, the instinct is to say, okay, well, you don't quite say city the same way I say city. I'm going to create a new word for city. But that defeats the purpose of interlink. The more I reuse concepts, the less I reinvent the wheel, the happier I will be in the end. And that's what this is about. Ooh. A dead, a dead looking, uh, ah, the internet is gone. This would be uh, what we call Murphy's Law. The computer scientist can't use the internet. Um, so that's the first thing that I'm talking about, is this idea that the first way I can use the semantic web, use the linked data web that exists already, is that I can um, look at what's out there, that what data is already out there. And instead of rewriting that, instead of republishing the population of Berlin, I will say DBpedia says the population of Berlin is X. The second thing that I can do is I can query the internet. I can ask the internet questions. I can say, oh, great and powerful internet. What is the population of Berlin? And it will give me an answer. And it will tell me who said it. And these things are useful because they are factual questions. And unlike conventional information retrieval, which is about getting a document that mentions the population of Berlin, I can now make specific questions. And so you can do some cool stuff with that. And uh, let me give you some examples here. We can ask questions here. So let me uh, actually go back to the DBpedia website. They have some example queries down here that are rather nice. Um, so you can read this. This has all sorts of useful information. In it. Yeah, so you can ask questions like, Give me people who were born in Berlin before 1900, German musicians with English descriptions, French films, first person shooter game, computer game, shooting computer games, and so on. But you can also ask more interesting questions. You can ask questions like, give me a list of people who played in the Bundesliga as goalkeeper from towns that had populations of less than 50,000 people. Which I think is one of the examples down here. Uh, you can ask questions like, you can ask these complicated questions. Someone did one on rap stars in Europe based on, yeah, I think it was popularity, uh, ra or, uh, music stars who had got gold record labels from towns of a specific size and so on. So you can ask all these complicated intermixed questions. These queries become extensional because we're talking about the properties of concepts, not just about strings. And similarly, so that's DBpedia. It's one of the largest and most central ones. Geonames is a geographical database, 
And we can ask questions like, give me people near a particular place within a one mile radius of a space. And actually that's something that the two chaps from uh, the Netherlands who may be in the room, uh, Pim Geert, what would be interesting to talk about there is this challenge that uh, a lot of the time in this database we have point data. So we have the geographic center, the representation for France is the natural center point of that hexagon. And that has uh, implications uh, in the way we represent and visualize things because not all French books were written in the middle of Paris or wherever. And finally, we have Europeana, and they are exposing a uh, Sparkle data set as well, which you can have a look at. We have some verbs from Sparkle, select, describe, construct, and ask. And we have the results can come back as graphs themselves, as tables, as XML, as JSON, and as text. And uh, actually, this always makes me think of this song, which some of you may know, the uh, So what you can think about yourselves is it's your select, construct, ask, and so on. You can buy it, use it, you can break it, you can fix it, and so on, okay? The point is that this actually gives you, moving, uh, gives you access to the semantic web. You can make use of the data here for actual purposes now and live, all right? And that's really extraordinarily powerful. So that's the second way we can use the semantic web. The third way is that we can enrich the content that we're producing. So in line in the HTML that we're talking about, we can begin to provide structured information for things. Okay? Why is this useful? Well, it adds the context. It allows us to disambiguate Ferdinand Foch's statement about his right and his center. I can now say that that's his, you know, the, the, the center of this particular army at this particular time, which is an army, which is part of a corps, which is part of a theater, and so on. The other thing is that it, if you use the right uh, vocabularies, the search engines will take advantage of that to answer for you. So if you search for particular theatrical events, if you search for uh, recipes, if you search for people, Google, Yandex, Bing, um, Baidu, and someone else have all got together and they have agreed that they will crawl these structured statements from RDFA and they will return different types of search results with that factual information in the table above rather than uh, just an entry to your web page. So it becomes extraordinarily powerful. So reviews are also a thing that's being done with this. So let me take an example. This is uh, from Trinity College Dublin's library of uh, Great Britain, Great British uh, propaganda from the First World War. And in case, in particular case, this is an Irish recipient of the Victoria Cross. And this is an example of the sort of resource that you might want to publish online and that you might want to show some semantics for. Because one of the other reasons that semantics are useful is in things like images, where there is very little text and there's a lot of human interpretation to be encoded. Okay? So we can look at this from a couple of perspectives. One perspective that we can look at is this is the metadata table as given by the entry by the librarians in Trinity. So they have the title, they have the names, they have the department number, they have the collections and so on. They have some subjects, some publishing and the copyright. But we can also encode the actual data in the poster. So what does the poster actually say? It says that this instance of this person is a military person. We can say that they have a name, Michael John O'Leary. We can say that they have this award, the Victoria Cross number 3556, which he obtained on the date 1915, February the 16th. Okay. One of the interesting things here is that the poster makes the statement that he has the rank of sergeant. If we look at his DBpedia page entry, uh, his rank is major. If you look at the citation from his Victoria Cross, he was a Lance Corporal. So which one is he? The answer is, is he, at different points in time, he was all of them, right? This is one of the things that the Sendari project has faced an enormous amount. And our kind of, I, I, I like to try and come up with, with sort of silly slogans for things. No one during World War I called World War I, World War I. Because no one thought there was going to be another one. You only call something one if you think there's going to be another one. 
And so we, don't have, we have this problem that in context, different generals, different commanders had different ranks as their careers advanced. So if you search for Major Michael John O'Leary in the Victoria Cross reference, in the text of that, you won't find it because he was nowhere near a major at the time. And so you have that challenge of the diachronics. And this helps you because you can say, this mention is this guy. So the guy who ultimately became Major O'Leary was at the time a sergeant or at the time a lieutenant or whatever. And another example where this comes up that's great fun is uh, Popes, because they change names quite, quite a bit. So Cardinal, um, Cardinal Ratzinger became Pope Benedict. That's a substantial change of that string. It's very hard. You'd never know that those two things were connected if you weren't uh, psychic or uh, using linked data. <laughs> so this is an example of what this would look like using the turtle language, which is a human-friendly way of writing uh, triples. And we have here, Michael John O'Leary is a DBpedia military person. So I've reused the concept of a military person from DBpedia. Not because I think it's the perfect thing, but because it's good enough that now we have some conversation, we, we can talk to DBpedia. He has this award, he has this rank, and so on and so forth. So, we've enriched, we've looked at two ways that we can use the content. We can reuse the concepts from the existing web. We can reuse the data from the existing web. We can link to other databases for more enriched information about the web. We can disambiguate. The other thing that we can do is we can actually take our published text and improve that. I've just run out of time. So what we can do is we can encode in the text what we call RDFA. So now this piece of text has all of that information in it. So I've marked up his birth date. I've marked up his name, his award, his honorific prefix, major. And I've also been able to say that this is this DBpedia thing. The crawlers will crawl this. They will extract that information. I can now ask Google, when was Michael John O'Leary born? And it will pull this data out. And one of the nice things about publishing this sort of stuff is that there are tools out there like the Silk, RDFAce, and other editors that will do some of this automatically for you. <coughs> so you can save enormous amounts of time. So the key point about the linked open data web is this one. You have your five stars of linked data. The first star is the most important. Put the thing on the web in whatever state it's in. It doesn't matter if it's a PDF full of GIF files of cats. Get it out there. Then get it into machine readable format. Then make that machine readable format not a Word or PDF document, but something more readable. Then after that, whoops. Encode it in RDF and finally link that RDF to it. But don't do it all together. Do it in steps. Do it wrong. Get it better. Get it right. Get into the community and you'll get a lot further along. This is this kind of suck it and see, break it and iterate it pr principle is the way to do this sort of stuff. Because you won't get it right all the way otherwise. And you'll never, it's, otherwise it becomes what they call a boil the ocean problem. Getting all of our knowledge onto the web in the perfect five star form from the start will require all the energy to boil all the oceans in the world at the same time. So what data do we have and what would, can we do with it? If you have CSV files, if you have fairly structured data, you can just write transformations and emit RDF immediately. If you have PDFs, you need to extract the text. They, you need to be very careful that they don't just have images on the pages and things, but they're tr somewhat tractable. If you have JPEGs, you're going to have to scan them or transcribe them. If you have XML, you can transform that immediately. There's just a statement to be done. And if you have text files, normally you can mark those up fairly easily. So that stuff is out there. There are tools for each of those. And if anyone has a specific data set that they want to try and translate, I'm very happy to talk about what sort of uh, software is out there to do it. Where do I get concepts from? There's a thing called Void, which describes data sets. And there's a search engine called Love, linked open vocabularies, which tells you which ones are most popular because remember, it's more important to have better agreement than more of precision. And you can just grab the concepts from that and use them. And when it comes to what you're ultimately doing is producing what we call a sparkle endpoint, which is a query point on the web that I can ask questions of. And for those, you have to be very careful because there are practical considerations here. 
Serving up a Sparkle endpoint is not the same as serving up a website. It costs memory, it costs processing power of an order or two of magnitude higher than serving up a nice simple website. So be aware that there is a technical challenge there that you need to talk to your, your computer science department or your IT infrastructure department about because otherwise you're going to melt someone's laptop. So this is my favorite, by the way, digital humanities uh, thing in the world. I just think of all humanists saying, can I borrow a cup of robots? And I think it's a perfect idea. But the point is this. The point that I would like you to go away with is five-star data is possible, but it's only possible if you iterate towards it. Go step by step by step. Don't think you can get all five stars in the first go. Endpoint availability is a big challenge. Even the very biggest, most prominent websites have hiccups. So be aware that the, the data, the linked data web is a best effort at the moment. Documentation is available, but doing your own matters a lot because you need to remember why you did things. And I haven't talked about provenance or licensing because I haven't had time, but both of those are key things that we can talk about uh, aside if you're interested. There are some key links for you to have a look at, and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>